Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another SECPA session today. Uh, during this, and it's a special session on uh, on Tuesday, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Ari Joff with us today. During this time of social and physical distancing, SACPA believes it's important to keep engaging with the public on issues of the day. And in order to do so, we are very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Um, today we have Dr. Ari Job. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, on the topic of the response to COVID-19. Do lockdowns cause more harm than benefit? Dr. Ari Joff is a pediatrician who specializes in pediatric infectious diseases and critical care medicine. He has practiced as a pediatric intensive care physician since 1995 at Stollerly Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, and is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Dr. Joff is also an adjunct clinical professor at John Dossiter Health Ethics Center at the University of Alberta. He has published in medical literature on topics including health ethics, long-term outcomes, and after intensive care in children, and sepsis. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Joff, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, as you heard, the title is uh, The Response to COVID-19, Do Lockdowns Cause More Harm Than Benefit? And I have done what I always do. I've made too many slides with too much information, so I will go through some of them quickly. Uh, of course, at the end, there will be time for questions. So next slide, please. An outline of what I'll... Uh, be talking about. First, I'll very briefly go through what uh, some of the initial predictions were that I consider induced fear in all of us, and then uh, go through some important new information about who is really at high risk, and then go through some of the unintended adverse effects of lockdowns, and finally come to a cost-benefit analysis where I will hopefully convince you that the mantra of saying lives versus economy is a false dichotomy, and we need to uh, uh, take seriously the cost-benefit analysis, and then I'll come to some suggestions of what we should do. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see that I, uh, an important point that I need to emphasize first is that uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused much morbidity and mortality. And this morbidity and mortality has been and continues to be very tragic. So on to uh, the initial predictions that induced fear. And uh, I'll show you some of the initial modeling studies. So on the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll first admit that uh, at the start, I was a strong proponent for lockdowns and I signed on and co-wrote a, a letter to the National Post calling on all levels of government to take this COVID-19 pandemic very seriously and lock down. And part of that was based on this uh, study uh, that you see published in Science. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll show you their uh, conclusions. They modeled um, uh, the pandemic and said that in order to uh, control it and not uh, uh, overcome hospital and ICU capacity, that we need lockdown and all the blue shaded periods here with very short intermittent opening up and then back to lockdowns. Lockdowns for 75% of the time, even after July 2022. And on the next slide is one of the most uh, influential studies that came out from the Imperial College COVID-19 response team, led by Neil Ferguson, uh, published on March 16th, 2020. And again, in the next slide, you see that they modeled that all the um, blue uh, boxes are times of lockdown that would be needed to control the pandemic. And they said this suppression would need to be enforced for the majority of the two years of the simulation. That is more than two thirds of the time that the population would have to be locked down. And on the next slide, uh, based on their assumptions that were uh, uh, have since been shown 
not to be accurate, they estimated that there would be 510,000 deaths in Great Britain and 2.2 million deaths in the US by mid-April, and that the patients would surpass ICU uh, capacity by 30 times. And uh, so that leads me to the next uh, point that this led to fear and crowd effects. And on the next slide, I summarize some of these. Uh, there seemed to be a contagion of fear and policies across the world, and I was influenced by this too. Social media uh, led to a growing sense of panic. Uh, the popular media uh, has uh, focused on absolute numbers, no denominators and no context and they're still doing this. And we all uh, uh, came to the impression that we're acting together against a common threat. We focused on one particular disease, COVID-19, uh, to the exclusion of all other health risks. And uh, we even uh, uh, bought into a war effort analogy where we, we all had this unquestioning presumption that the cause is right and the fight will be won. So on the next slide, I come to some new information that uh, uh, emerged as the pandemic continued. And uh, I consider one of the most important points to talk about the infection fatality rate. And on, on the next slide, this shows that uh, uh, a world-known uh, epidemiologist, John Ioannidis, uh, published in preprint and then uh, later in October, this uh, peer-reviewed publication about the infection fatality rate. And what he did uh, as he went through uh, 61 studies, 74 estimates up to September 9, 2020, and these were all studies based on seroprevalence, which is measuring antibody in the population against COVID to tell how many people have actually uh, uh, been infected with the virus. And the infection fatality rate, it's important to know, is much lower than the case fatality rate, which is what gets reported to us all the time. Because uh, what the uh, serology, the antibody studies show us, is that many infected people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and are not detected by testing because they don't come for testing. And when you look at uh, how many people in different populations have been infected and the mortality uh, uh, cases from COVID, it turns out that the median infection fatality rate is 0.23%. And among people who are less than 70 years old, the median infection fatality rate is 0.05%. What that means is that for people under 70 years old, usually 99.95% of them will survive the COVID infection. And even that, on the next slide, I, I mentioned some reasons why that is likely an overestimate of the infection fatality rate. And the true infection fatality rate is probably uh, significantly lower than 0.23%. And that is because in these antibody studies, the people who are highest risk for the virus are more difficult to recruit because they're in vulnerable uh, populations. And on top of that, uh, serology is not 100% sensitive and misses uh, a significant number of cases that uh, have had the virus. So that 0.23% is uh, an upper estimate of the median infection fatality rate. And I'll give you some examples of studies that looked at that. This is one of the better ones from Geneva, Switzerland. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you in a table what their infection fatality rates are that are in the box there. And you can see that in young people, uh, including less than up to 64 years old, the infection fatality rate is very low. And it doesn't come up to uh, uh, over 1%, so up to 2.7% until people are 65 years old or older. On the next slide uh, uh, is another study that uh, from France that shows this in graphical form on, on the next slide. And you can see here that um, they show in the circled uh, graph the probability of being hospitalized if infected. And that goes up markedly with uh, as age increases. Uh, and 
the next slide shows that uh, for those people who are hospitalized, the uh, mortality rate also goes up with age. So this next slide shows what I want to emphasize is that the infection fatality rate is very low until uh, the an inflection point on that uh, graph around 70 years old, where the risk then significantly rises. The next slide shows uh, the similar data for Alberta that shows that hospitalizations go up with age, but I want to focus on the last um, uh, uh, column of that graph, which is the deaths, and that's the case fatality rate is very low. Even in 50 to 59 year old patients, it's 0.16%. In 60 to 69, it's 1.18%. It goes up markedly once people are 70 years old and especially 80 years and over. And that is showing the case fatality rate. And remember that the infection fatality rate is usually at least five to 10 times lower than that. So in Alberta, 86% of the deaths from COVID-19 have been 70 years or older. Uh, the next slide shows similar data for Canada. And I put in the uh, case fatality rate at each age uh, on the graph. And you can see that the case fatality rate starts rising at 60 and really goes up once uh, people are 70 years old or older. And again, that's the case fatality rate. The infection fatality rate is five to 10 times lower. And so in Canada, 89.3% of the deaths are on people age 70 years and older. Uh, so that leads me to the next point, uh, which is about uh, high-risk groups. And the next slide shows you uh, a study that uh, uh, came out that looked at uh, the high, uh, main uh, risks uh, in epicenters of the pandemic in 14 countries and 13 states. And the next slide shows their uh, conclusions that people under 65 years old have 30 to 100 times lower relative risk of death. And in Canada, that is people under 65 are 100 times less likely to die of COVID than people 65 and older. And uh, most of the deaths have occurred in nursing homes, at least half of the deaths in Europe and North America, and 80% uh, in Canada. So again, there's a steep inflection point in the mortality rate around the age of 70 years old. And the next slide, uh, I come to what, some, what are some of the other risk factors for uh, COVID-related uh, mortality. And this is the biggest study that I am aware of uh, uh, from the UK. And in the next slide, uh, they show the risks for different uh, uh, comorbidities. And I know it's small and you probably can't see it in detail, but the main point is in the box that I've uh, uh, highlighted at the top left, uh, the hazard ratio, the risk for death, the strongest risk factor is age. You can see that uh, in the young, the, the risk compared to uh, 50 to 59 year olds is extremely low. And for 80 years old uh, and higher is extremely high. And that dwarfs uh, the risk from even severe other comorbidities uh, like obesity and severe diabetes and severe uh, kidney dysfunction and even uh, organ transplant. So uh, by far the strongest risk factor is age. And on the next slide, I show that the Alberta Health Services Scientific Advisory Group uh, came to the same conclusion. In fact, uh, they looked through the evidence for what are the risk factors for uh, adverse outcomes from COVID. And their conclusion is that of the risk factors considered, so all the comorbidities, only age had a high strength association with death and a highly consistent association with death. On the next slide, I, I mentioned a, a paper that came out from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And uh, the table on the next slide shows what I want to uh, emphasize. So you can see, uh, I've put in yellow there, the 
uh, case fatality rate in patients 0 to 59 years old that have 0, 1, 2, or 3 or more of these comorbidities. And you see, can see there's not a strong association of case fatality rate with mortality. On the next slide, I circle there that when that happens is that once you're age 60 and older, where 60 to 79 is where the impact of comorbidities is very strong. And as a patient has more comorbidities, the case fatality rate goes up. So all these other uh, comorbidities are most important in people who are 60 years old and older. So now I'll switch gears. And uh, on the next slide, I, I come to what are some of the unintended effects of the lockdowns that we should have considered and I should have considered in recommending lockdowns. And that is what people have called the collateral damage from lockdowns. And on the next slide, I show that, you know, what it turns out uh, to be the case is that the adverse effects of COVID are like the tip of the iceberg and all the collateral effects of lockdowns are, uh, may uh, highly outweigh the uh, benefits of uh, preventing COVID uh, infection. So in the next several tables, I'm going to go through some of the adverse effects. I obviously don't have time to go through each one in detail, but um, I will um, mention most of them. So on the next slide, I show that uh, the lockdowns have basically put the sustainable development goals out of reach for uh, globally. And that is because uh, the response to COVID, not COVID itself, but the response to it, the lockdowns, has caused several adverse effects. One of them, and, and I won't go through all the numbers in detail, but these affect millions, each of them, millions of people, sometimes many millions of people. So childhood vaccination programs have been stalled in 70 countries. Education has been affected with school closures. 90% uh, of students around the world were kept out of school. And in November, still over 500 million were affected by uh, uh, that and that has long-term effects on their entire future uh, longevity and potential. Sexual and reproductive health services were interrupted and that will lead to millions more unsafe abortions and unintended pregnancy. Uh, food security was affected and it's estimated by the UN that the hunger pandemic with uh, undernourished people will increase by 83 to 132 million people. That's over 225,000 people a day who are put in hunger and uh, uh, potential for starvation. And that will affect millions of children with uh, wasting. On the next slide, uh, I uh, mentioned poverty. Extreme poverty, which is unimaginable to us, which is living on less than $1.90 a day US, will, is estimated to increase by over 70 million people. And millions of children will be in uh, these poor households. Interrupted uh, maternal and uh, reproductive and neonatal and child health services are estimated to increase uh, 1.16 million child deaths in children under five and many thousands of maternal deaths. Violence against women is increasing because of household stress and disrupted uh, livelihoods and intimate partner violence uh, is estimated to have increased by over 15 million cases and progress on preventing female genital mutilation and child marriages uh, is also uh, affected and millions more will be affected by this. On the next slide, I talk briefly about some of the infections that will be uh, increased because of interrupted services, including diagnosis and treatment and uh, prevention of these infections. And for tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV, at least many hundreds of thousands more people uh, will die of these because of these interruptions. And it may be even up to in the uh, millions of people. On the next slide, I talk about some of these uh, collateral effects even occur in our countries, our high-income countries. 
with uh, delayed and uh, avoided and disrupted medical care, people aren't presenting for heart attack and stroke because they're uh, fearful of catching COVID at the hospital. Cancer care and non-urgent procedures are being interrupted. There are big surgery backlogs in all the provinces and wait times have markedly increased. And in fact, studies show that of excess deaths in high income countries during the pandemic, 20 to 50% are not due to COVID-19 and are likely related to these uh, interrupted healthcare services. Even something as sad as uh, an increase in uh, deaths from dementia has occurred in England and Wales and also in the United States, probably because uh, the isolated uh, elderly people with dementia are basically dying of loneliness. Intimate partner violence has also increased in our high income countries. On the next uh, slide, uh, uh, deaths of despair related to unemployment and drugs, alcohol and suicide are projected to increase. In the US, uh, uh, thousands of suicide deaths are predicted. The mental health effects are, are predicted to uh, cause uh, over 7 million years of life loss in Canada alone. And there's also a surge in opioid deaths that has already been documented in Alberta and uh, uh, Canada. So the next slide, I, I want to put some of these numbers in context because we are being bombarded with numbers of COVID cases and numbers of COVID deaths, but those are absolute numbers and we don't have we're not uh, intuitively good at huge numbers. And um, so what I'm showing here is looking at all the deaths from COVID and uh, uh, up to December 11th, deaths uh, in 2018 or 19, whichever was the most recent I could get. And assuming that the same number of deaths would occur this year, so uh, we're saying in 75% of the year, so I multiplied the uh, expected deaths by 75%. To come to this last column, what proportion of deaths that have occurred this year uh, are associated with COVID? And you can see that globally, 3.48% of the deaths have been due to COVID. That means over 96% of the deaths that have been occurring worldwide, we're not hearing about. And on the next slide, I circle about uh, Canada and Alberta specifically, and it's similar. Up to December 11th in Canada, COVID accounted for about 6% of all the deaths. And in Alberta, 3.51% of all the deaths. So we are not getting the absolute numbers for over 96% of the deaths that are, are occurring in our province. On the next slide, I, I, I show this, um, uh, the world global deaths uh, that occur in non-pandemic years, and that's, uh, we expect 160,000 deaths per day, and this is highly unequal. On the next slide, I, uh, uh, on this, the box show under five mortality rate, and that is highly unequal across the world. So uh, the point of that is that if we focused on preventing these under five mortality deaths, we could avert uh, many millions of deaths, more than the number of deaths that have occurred from uh, COVID. And I put the number of deaths of COVID on this next slide to put it in perspective. Again, up to uh, December 7th, COVID has accounted for 3.5% of all the deaths globally. On the next slide, I, I go through uh, many of the individual causes of death uh, in the world today, outside of uh, before the COVID pandemic. And on the next slide, I put uh, COVID numbers there for to put it in perspective. And, and the circled parts are to show you that although it's terrible that COVID is causing over 4,000 deaths a year globally, uh, Every year, tuberculosis causes a similar number. Uh, uh, poor diet, dietary risk factors causes far more. And uh, preventable under five uh, deaths from pneumonia and diarrhea causes uh, over 3,600 deaths a day. 
so that leads to uh, um, what is my um, main hope that I've only left a few minutes for, is to show you a cost-benefit analysis of the uh, uh, lockdowns. And from this, I take from uh, Dr. Paul Fridgers, who's an economist in the UK, and he talked about what he calls the corona dilemma. He says, imagine you're the decision maker who can pull the lever on the train tracks to avoid the coming train from going straight. Next slide, if you do not divert the train, one person, John, will get run over. He is elderly and suffering from many diseases. You know him personally, and all his friends and family are watching you. They are all shouting at you to divert the train, claiming it is the moral and safe thing to do. You know that if you do not pull the lever, your life in the society you live in is over. Next slide shows if you pull the lever, the diverted train will run over 50 random people from all over the world as the train drives through them, including people in your own country. Yet these people and their friends won't know where the train came from that hit them. So on the next slide, I show how does this uh, translate to coronavirus? Well, uh, first, if you do not divert the train, you are letting the virus rage unchecked and causing the COVID deaths. That's the one individual there. On the next slide, if you pull the lever, the diverted train will put whole countries into isolation, destroying many international industries and thus affecting the livelihood of billions, which through reduced government services and general prosperity will cost tens of millions of lives. That's the COVID reaction. And on the next slide, you see what did we do? The world pulled the lever. And now unintended health consequences of these measures are, are going to be outlined here. And they unfortunately did not play a part in modeling or policy. So in the next uh, slide, I talk about how can we make this cost benefit analysis? Well, we have to realize that health resources are finite and the well-being of the population is the ultimate goal of government. So we need a common metric to make comparisons of the costs and benefits. So we'll say that uh, the uh, common metric is to maximize the sum of years lived by the population. And we weight those years by their quality or their well-being. Uh, so uh, quality adjusted life years are well-being years. And well-being is measured by life satisfaction. And uh, one regular year of happy life is worth about six well-being years, uh, well-bees. And that captures almost everything that is important to people. And we need the, this common metric to make the comparison. So on the next slide, I first talk about what are the benefits of lockdowns? Well, that would be prevented COVID deaths. And using the age distribution of deaths and the comorbidities uh, across many uh, countries, it's been estimated that each uh, death from COVID uh, costs three to five quality adjusted life years which is uh, times six, 18 to 30 well bees per death. So if we do the big calculation, we could say if lo lockdown saved 360 million well bees. And how we get that is we say, well, 50% of the population would be infected until there's herd immunity and the infection's under control. The infection fatality rate will high, give a high estimate of 0.3%. And there are 7.8 billion people in the world. And each death costs five quality adjusted life years. So that's 360 million well bees that we prevent by lockdown. It's, uh, of course, likely much lower because those estimates are high. So I have to make an important point now before I go to the costs of lockdowns. And that is that people often talk about COVID deaths versus the economy. And that is simply a false dichotomy uh, because the economy is about lives. And uh, it's what we're comparing is COVID deaths versus deaths due to economic recession. So it's lives versus lives. And we need to choose the least harmful of two horrible choices. The next slide is... Uh, cartoon showing that we need to choose between COVID-19 and all the uh, well-being and effects on longevity of 
an economic recession. So the next slide shows how can we measure the effects of recession deaths. And that can be based on two methods. One is looking at historical evidence, because there's a strong lung relation between government spending and life expectancy. And that makes sense because the government spends on services that affect life expectancy. That's things like healthcare, education, roads, sanitation, housing, nutrition, vaccines, safety, social security nets, clean energy, all the social determinants of health. And if the a public system will be forced to spend less money on our future, then statistical lives will be lost because people will die in the years to come. And a general rule, a uh, maximum cost is $75,000 per quality adjusted life year. It turns out we get similar uh, number by looking at what the government uses to estimate how much uh, they should spend on high health and life. And uh, that's how costly it is to save people from illness. And it turns out that a maximum cost for that is about $80,000 will uh, is uh, an expenditure that will buy one quality adjusted life year. So remember, we're treating the lockdown as a public health policy because that's what it is. It's about saving lives. So we should treat decisions about lockdown the same way we treat decisions about how to spend on other um, uh, things that affect uh, the uh, life, like cancer, heart disease, etc. So it's estimated the recession will be at least 6% of GDP and will take many years to recover. So what this means is over the coming decade, the global globally, uh, we'll lose about $50 trillion worth of GDP. Sorry, and so the next slide um, shows that we can make a calculation about recession deaths. If we say the recession is $50 trillion, 40% of that is uh, government expenditure, contribution to GDP, and we'll use a high estimate of $100,000 per quality. That means that the recession will cost 1.2 billion Welbies and likely much more because we used um, assumptions that were biased against uh, uh, not doing lockdown. And I'll quickly go through two other costs. One is the loneliness and anxiety effect, which uh, causes people's well being to decrease and uh, unemployment effect, which again causes people's well-being to decrease. And these are low estimates because they don't consider the effect of loneliness and unemployment on lifespan. They only uh, right now consider in this calculation their effects on uh, person, uh, people's subjective well-being. And uh, just uh, so we don't underestimate the effects of these on lifespan and lives lost, this is a review that just came out this year about social determinants of health and survival in humans. And you can see in the graphs that as income goes up, life expectancy goes up. As social network index goes up, meaning people are more socially connected, their life expectancy goes up. And as adverse childhood experiences in the in graph C, uh, as there are fewer of them, their life expectancy goes up. And similarly, all these things affect the incidence of many chronic, uh, severe chronic diseases. In fact, uh, perceived loneliness is maybe the most potent threat to survival and longevity. It's in, among the top three risk factors for death due to cardiovascular disease. It's a top risk factor for death in the next decade, and it increases uh, the incidence of many other uh, chronic diseases. So here is the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the benefit is uh, preventing COVID uh, deaths, and the cost is from the recession and government inability to uh, government uh, spending austerity on determinants of health and longevity. And you can see that it comes to the costs are five times higher than the benefits on a minimum. And using more realistic numbers, it's at least 20 times. And I did a uh, similar calculation for Canada on the next slide. 
and at similar it comes out to the uh, cost being 10 times higher than the uh, benefits and probably more realistically at least 40 times. So in the next slide I will finish with saying well then what do I think we should do? Because I think we need to change the trolley track that we've chosen. And my final slide is this. Uh, I think what I've tried to do uh, today is to, to educate us a bit more on uh, understanding the risks from COVID and the trade-offs involved. And we need to use a cost-benefit balance for anything we decide to do. So we should focus on protecting those at high risk. Uh, we should keep schools open. We should uh, increase surge capacities in hospital if necessary and invest in improving the social determinants of health. And I give some uh, specific ideas on the slide. Thank you. Wow, I'm very impressed at how much you packed into a half hour talk. Well done. Um, we've got quite a few questions, so I'll just jump right in. Um, Laurie Schultz asks, as you research shows age, and then in brackets 60 and over, is the highest risk factor, what is the appropriate response? So age 60 and over is the highest risk factor, and what is the appropriate response then? Right. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that the highest risk is age 70 and over. People who are in their 60s with severe comorbidities are also at higher risk. And I think that's where we need to focus our uh, protection. And what does that mean? Well, one thing is we need to focus on nursing homes, something that uh, was not done and I think probably is still not done adequately. We need to make sure healthcare workers only work in one nursing home and not more, that they have adequate personal protective equipment, that they have more staff, and that their staff are paid more equitably. Uh, and then, you know, lockdowns right now are affecting everybody. And I think what we need to realize is people need to consider their risk and lockdown uh, as much as they perceive is uh, important to do. So uh, instead of everybody being locked down, I think the people who are in those high risk categories should be more careful. They should be the ones staying home. They should be the ones working from home if they're still employed. They should be the ones not going to work. Uh, they should be asking people to do the, their grocery shopping for them. They should wear masks all the time, as we all should, but they should in particular be more careful. And I think uh, uh, that's where we need to focus our uh, prevention efforts. Um, our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Were not the early projections based on the assumptions that this would have happened if no mitigations or restrictions were imposed? Uh, can you repeat that again? Absolutely. Mark Goodall, um, were not the early projections based on the assumptions that this would have happened if no mitigation or restrictions were imposed? Uh, yes, so you, I think you mean the initial projections on my first few slides. I think so too, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, yes, so those were projections of uh, meaning the 2.2 uh, million deaths in the U.S. by mid-April. Yes, that was projected if nothing was done. Uh, but those were based on uh, inaccurate numbers for what is needed to achieve herd immunity and what the infection fatality rate is. So the, they estimated infection fatality rate was 0.9% and it's uh, uh, likely closer to 0.2% and that the herd immunity needed more than 80% of the population infected and it's more likely closer to 40% based on more recent research. Uh, and uh, the modeling uh, parameters were uh, 
heavily criticized because they uh, were not released to the public. But yes, th those were projections if nothing was done, but those uh, were related estimates. And in my cost-benefit analysis, I tried to be generous to what the lockdowns could prevent with uh, uh, compared to if no lockdowns happened. So, you know, in the calculation, I used 50% uh, people infected to herd immunity. The infection fatality rate was 0.3%. And, um, and uh, with that, still came to at least five times higher cost than benefit. And Mark follows that up with what do you have to say what to say what was happening in Italy and Iran where initially no mitigations were put in place? Uh, yeah, so there are some epicenters where uh, things were perfect for uh, uh, things to not work out well. And I don't know about Iran, but uh, for Italy, um, uh, many of their hospital systems were stressed, a few were uh, overwhelmed. And but uh, that is partly because one, they have the uh, oldest population on average in Europe. Uh, two, they have the one of the lowest uh, healthcare capacities uh, in terms of hospital beds per population and ICU beds per population. And, um, and three, they made some bad decisions where um, uh, people were uh, sent to nursing homes instead of be, uh, that were not uh, adequately resourced to protect them. So I think uh, all of that uh, culminated in uh, a bad, uh, obviously terrible uh, outcome with the first wave in Italy. Uh, but uh, uh, when we look at many other uh, uh, systems, uh, we can predict, especially in Canada, that the healthcare system would unlikely be overwhelmed. Our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. My concern is the only recently multi-organ asymptomatic effect of our immune response. Oh, that's quite a sentence, eh? Are we just setting the so-called less at-risk age group up for their new com comorbidities for other viruses? Would you like me to repeat that? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. My concern is the only recently multi-organ asymptomatic effects of our immune response are we just setting the so-called less at risk age groups up for their new comorbidities for other viruses? Uh, okay, I think, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but uh, I think uh, that you're asking whether the people who have mild cases of COVID will have sequelae that uh, will set them up for uh, disease or susceptibility in the future. And uh, so one of one part of that is, do people with uh, very mild or asymptomatic COVID have organ injuries that uh, will lead to long-term adverse outcomes? Uh, there's a lot of conjecture about that, um, but so far nothing uh, definitive, meaning uh, people have done MRI studies uh, to suggest that there might be inflammation in the heart in many of the young people who have had COVID. Uh, they've done x-rays to suggest a small uh, proportion might have some lung fibrosis. Um, I think that we have to interpret uh, those studies with great caution. And the reason I say that is that one, no one has done those kinds of studies with other viruses. So we have to remember that there's 
very intense study of COVID-19, and we simply don't know if these same findings happen with other uh, common viruses we've been experiencing for uh, decades. And two, the the actual significance of those findings is very unclear right now uh, and will may very well be of no significance, meaning that they might be traces of previous infection, but they may resolve with no sequelae, and we don't really know that. I'm not sure if you're asking about uh, long COVID, uh, but uh, I won't talk about that until someone asks if they're interested, ask that. I hope I answered their question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Laurie Schult. You, could you comment on Australia's approach? They have had significant lockdown, but their economy is coming back very robustly with low COVID rates. Uh, sure. Well, I will say that I'm not an expert uh, in what's happening in all uh, countries around the world, but I have talked to several people in Australia and talking to them, that would not be their take on what's happened. Um, well, they do have low COVID rates. That's because they had very, very strict lockdowns, especially in Victoria. Uh, the province of Victoria in Australia, and uh, many people considered that uh, a violation of their rights. Um, but uh, their economy, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but talking to economists there, they do not believe that the economy has uh, not suffered and uh, that long term it, uh, they believe it well, it's still uh, has and will continue to suffer. And the other point is, uh, I think it's early to know uh, how successful they are because uh, they may uh, now, uh, I don't think they can keep cases low indefinitely. And uh, as they open up, more cases are likely to occur. Uh, so I think we still don't know, or at least I don't know exactly how to interpret uh, the experience in Australia. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Herd immunity is based on long-term immunity in, in infected survivors. Do we know how long the immunity actually lasts? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Okay, I'll talk a bit about herd immunity, but uh, the first point I'd make is that uh, the cost-benefit analysis that I talk about uh, does not rely on herd immunity. So it's uh, it, uh, uh, in terms of long-term herd immunity, it, it still measures the cost-benefit balance of lockdowns. Now, herd immunity uh, relies on long-term immunity. Uh, but uh, so does vaccine-induced uh, herd immunity. Uh, and so a point I'd make is we don't know, well, some points. First, we don't know how long immun natural immunity to COVID lasts. Uh, if it's similar to uh, coronaviruses that have uh, our common cold coronaviruses, it may last for up to a year. Uh, and if it's similar to SARS, uh, it might last for longer. Uh, we just don't know right now. Uh, if it lasts uh, longer, then uh, uh, natural herd immunity will uh, can be achieved. Um, if it does not last longer, well, we can achieve herd immunity still for each wave of infection and uh, vaccine induced herd immunity will have the same problem and uh, would need booster doses at whatever the same interval is and that leads to feasibility issues because we're talking about immunizing virtually everyone on earth uh, 
many times if her, if immunity is uh, not long lasting, and um, it remains to be seen how well we can uh, uh, achieve that production capacity and distribution uh, capacity uh, to achieve it. Our next question comes from uh, Denver Florence. Hopefully we can, and it's more a comment I think, hopefully we can let working families get back to work and children back to school, dot, dot, dot. This lockdown is an insane experience that, will, that we will experience the horrors of for years longer than COVID's horrors. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for that comment. I think uh, what I would say with that is that I think we need to hold our uh, public health and government authorities to justify the lockdowns by doing a detailed cost benefit analysis. and. Uh, and I think that's what was not done adequately, and that's what I'm arguing. So, yes, I, I agree with you. Our next question comes from um, a person who doesn't, uh, who uses a, not their real name. How can we get the Alberta government to change their course of action? Well, uh, that is a good question. I, I am a clinician and don't have expertise in influencing public policy and uh, government. Uh, so my honest answer is I don't know. I've tried, uh, um, you know, to argue this uh, within our uh, health system and offered to argue it to public health and uh, without success. So um, I think the more people that know this and push uh, their uh, government representatives, I suppose that's the best way to go about it. I know that uh, there are court cases, which uh, I'm not eager to participate in that are taking the government to task, asking if they could justify the um, imposition on charter freedoms. I know the Justice Center is uh, looking at that, but uh, my honest answer is uh, I wish I knew. Our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. How do we allow for not following rules to NICUs in Calgary each had two different visitors who knew they were infected. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Again, you know, I have to say I, I, that is outside of my expertise. Um, I think our response definitely needs to rely on people following uh, the directives, I wonder if, um, you know, I think if the directives are reasonable and backed up by better evidence and cost-benefit analysis, maybe people will be uh, more eager to follow them closely. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think that's right to, to introduce uh, risk to the most vulnerable patients because, uh, um, you know, that's not having everyone play their part. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what we do about that. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Those 60 years and over contribute significant dollars to the economy and then in brackets, earners and purchasing power, etc. What would a COVID call, uh, and then in brackets, long-term health effects and death cost the economy? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you're asking if, uh, you know what, I, I, the answer is I don't know. 
I'm not advocating for um, just allowing everyone in that age group to be exposed to COVID and, and experience the risk of mortality. I think I'm advocating for a more focused response where we aim to protect those people, the people uh, that are high risk, so uh, 60 and over with um, uh, multiple comorbidities or 70 years and older, and not uh, have them uh, uh, face the risk of uh, COVID death. Um, and in that way, we minimize as much as we can the, the effects of COVID on that population. Uh, so if I'm interpreting correctly, I don't think that uh, any of us are advocating for just letting uh, COVID run rampant in those higher risk age groups and then that having its huge effects on the economy. Thank you. That's a, actually a good clarification. Um, our next question kind of follows up on that. So I think um, you may have just answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. How do you keep long term care staff from bringing COVID into where they work if we left COVID running in the community unchecked for people? Yeah, well, uh, you know what? we. We have ways to uh, to do that. We make sure that the healthcare workers, uh, if they have any symptoms, they do not come to work uh, in the nursing home or elsewhere. That uh, they wear PPE, so universal masking uh, will prevent the large majority of asymptomatic transmissions of COVID. So there needs to definitely be universal masking in all nursing homes. Um, if a patient has symptoms, then we need adequate staffing and personal protective equipment in the nursing homes. So I think it is achievable if we have focus uh, funding to allow these things to be done in uh, nursing homes. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jennifer Copeland. Why, in your analysis, are you only putting reducing death rates on the side of restrictions? There are economic, health care and quality of life costs to having excessive illness in our population. Right. Uh, the, so say that last part again, there are I'll say the whole question again. Why okay. in your analysis are you only putting reducing death rates on the side of restrictions? There are economic health care and quality of life costs to having excessive illness in a population. Right. Okay, so that's arguing that um, <clears throat> uh, I know some people have argued that uh, if uh, we let um, COVID rates increase, that uh, there will be the same amount of economic damage because people will voluntarily uh, um, curtail their participation in the economy. I think that's not borne out by uh, uh, the empirical data, which suggests that um, the lockdown orders are what is uh, most strongly associated with uh, reduced economic activity. And um, so I think there are two, that's similar to an argument that, well, the economic damage would happen either way. And I don't think that's true. One is because first we need to uh, control the fear. And that is that to, uh, educate people about what their risks are and what the trade-offs are. And if people are uh, more realistic and know their actual risks, uh, they will be less fearful uh, to participate in the economy. And the second part of that is uh, the studies that have been done suggest that the vast, uh, that most of the economic damage is due to lockdown orders and loss of uh, small businesses having uh, to close down. Uh, 
In terms of the other quality of life parts, I think that leads to uh, considerations of long COVID, so-called long COVID, which uh, definitely can occur. I think right now the data emerging uh, is a bit unclear on how frequently that happens and the severity of the symptoms. So there are definitely some people who have significant symptoms from uh, long COVID for many weeks and sometimes for months. Uh, the incidence of that is probably uh, much lower than uh, we're being led to uh, believe uh, uh, because of some of the design limitations of some of the studies and also the severity of it is very unclear because most of the studies ask people if they have fatigue or headaches and uh, if they answer yes they're uh, counted as uh, long COVID but uh, uh, in the very few studies that ask about the severity of those symptoms most of the time uh, for most of those patients, the severity is low, uh, is quite low. And we need to also compare to uh, control groups uh, during this, this same time period because surveys of populations in Canada and the US and elsewhere uh, show that a significant proportion of the population is experiencing anxiety and uh, even post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms and depression and mental illness. Uh, and so it becomes very hard to tease out um, uh, what is long COVID and what is the mental health effects from lockdown uh, and fear. So, um, but I will point out that even if we are generous and assume that long COVID uh, will have a significant incidence and significant severity, the severity and incidence would need to be very, very large in order to tip the balance in favor of lockdowns, looking at the cost benefit analysis. Um, we have four more questions and I'm keenly aware that it's now <laughs> 11 a.m. Um, are you? Ready to entertain four more questions? Uh, sure, only if they're easy questions. <laughs> I, no, I'm I can't guarantee that at all. Um, <laughs> our next question is from Laurie Schultz. Is COVID a hoax? Are restrictions in place now wrong? Are anti-maskers correct in not wearing masks? Are the recommendations, I said four questions, here's already a whole slew. Mm -hmm. Are you recommending that life should carry on as in pre-COVID times for 60 and under age group. All right. Uh, okay, well, the first part is COVID a hoax. I would say no. Uh, COVID-19 is there and it's had uh, severe effects. And, uh, and I don't want to give the impression that I am taking its uh, terrible effects lightly because as I tried to point out in couple of the slides on important points. Um, there has been severe uh, mortality and morbidity effects, and I'm not taking those lightly. Those are horrible. Uh, but what I want to do is um, minimize those horrible effects and decide uh, how to have the fewest deaths and the, the lowest uh, adverse effect on population well-being. And I think lockdowns are not the way to do that. Uh, in terms, uh, in, uh, am I saying that uh, the younger people should just be allowed to uh, do whatever? I think uh, it's reasonable to not be completely back to normal uh, uh, in, in uh, trying to pre, uh, prevent um, uh, overwhelming our healthcare capacity. So what I mean by that is I think that um, I would have to think twice about whether uh, I sh we should support very large gatherings like concerts and, you know, indoor concerts and uh, huge gatherings. I think that um, to answer your question about masks, uh, 
you know what, that's been a very controversial issue. I think the science is not uh, completely clear on the benefits and harms of uh, wearing masks in the community, but I think it's a uh, reasonable thing to do, even for younger people. Uh, uh, while we're in the middle of a, a, a surge of cases. So I probably have not answered your question completely. I guess what I would say is, uh, I think we need to focus on those at high risk, let the rest of us get on with our lives, but uh, do that within reason um, and maybe not have uh, huge gatherings yet and uh, probably supporting mask wearing, uh, although uh, keeping an open mind and if evidence emerges that they're not beneficial, then I would support going with the evidence. Okay. Our next question comes from Bridge City News, which is a local Lethbridge news outlet. Um, hi, Dr. Jeff. And then they say from SACPA. And what that means is I think they've taken this directly from the flyer that we sent out. Um, recent debate has framed decisions as a trade-off between life and the economy, but the speaker will argue that this could be a false dichotomy. And they're asking, can you explain that, please? Okay, so a false dichotomy is uh, making a choice seem to be between uh, two options and no other options. And, um, and so it's often framed as lives versus the economy. And the reason I say that's uh, false is because that gives the impression that we're just talking about, should we save lives or should we let people get rich and be prosperous by a thriving economy? And that is the wrong way to frame it. <clears throat> uh, because when the economy is severely affected and there is a recession, that causes uh, the population to experience a lower life expectancy over the decades to come. and uh, more chronic diseases <clears throat> and decreased well-being and so we're talking about lies versus lies so we could say the better dichotomy is covid effects on lives and economic recession effect on lives uh, so what i mean by the false dichotomy is that it's a misleading way to frame the choices thank you our next question comes from Belinda Croson. How many of the issues you've highlighted are actually decades of ignore, ignoring poverty issues, housing issues, racial inequalities, etc., that COVID has merely highlighted and exasperated? Uh, <clears throat> it's yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it's uh, true that that um, the healthcare and uh, well-being and mortality rates are are very unequal in society, and it's true that COVID has uh, unmasked that and exacerbated that. So um, I think what that has taught me is that. Uh, being in a privileged position, uh, I didn't realize all of these effects and COVID has definitely taught me uh, what I should have known uh, before is how unequal things are in society and how there's structural uh, racism and how there's um, uh, uh, cycles of poverty and disadvantage and COVID has definitely exacerbated that. And that's why I put in my last slide is that I think what one of our strategies for controlling COVID and improving the future is to invest in improving the social determinants of health, meaning inequalities, homelessness, and poverty. So um, uh, I think what you're saying is uh, very important. <clears throat> 
Okay, while you were talking there, I just put up the last slide so people could see. Our last question today is from uh, Henning Mundo. If compliance to our health guidelines could be more strongly enforced, thus COVID rates significantly decreased, is it reasonable to assume that collateral effects outlined would be greatly reduced? Um, well, there are a few uh, things to consider with that. One is um, some of the collateral effects I talked about were uh, global. And I think it's important to recognize that the, econ the global economy is more interconnected now than it ever has been. And when we shut down, um, we affect uh, supply chains and demand chains that affect not just people in our city and our country, but in all countries and have many of the collateral effects on developing countries that uh, lead to uh, a stalled progress and, and reversal of many of the uh, gains on sustainable development goals. I think that um, uh, the, the, the many of the some of the collateral damage, meaning the economic effects, would uh, uh, with their effect on future longevity and uh, well-being, uh, would still occur. Uh, I think in terms of the effects on um, deaths of despair and loneliness and unemployment, I think those would still occur. Uh, the the effects on overwhelm healthcare systems, uh, yes, might be avoided, but um, I think that it would not prevent many of the effects on people not presenting for uh, emergencies because of fear of uh, contracting COVID and people um, uh, having deaths of despair and in terms of cancelled surgeries, I think those would still happen because in the lockdowns, um, the hospitals still prepare for uh, surges that in the first wave didn't happen and uh, closed down many services that uh, uh, resulted in these collateral effects um, while COVID cases were low. So I'm not sure that um, that the collateral effects would be avoided. Thank you very much. That was the end of our questions. Um, we have a couple of thank yous from Mark Goodall. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Only history will tell what should have or could have been done differently, I guess. At the very least, let us hope that we have learned enough to prepare for the next pandemic, which is inevitable, but when? And then thank you from Laurie Schultz. Thank you, Dr. Joff, for your presentation this morning. And thank you also on behalf of SECPA. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. Before we end the session today, do you have a take-home question for us? Or a take-home message, rather? Uh, I think the main thing I would say, uh, the take-home is um, we any response we have to the COVID-19 pandemic should be based on uh, our best analysis of the costs and benefits of that response. And I think that has not been done adequately yet, and we need more than healthcare experts to inform that analysis. Uh, we need uh, social scientists and economists and, and uh, policy experts to help come balance the trade-offs. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Um, on Thursday, on our regular session, we will have uh, Brian Bradley, Byron, sorry, Byron Bradley from the Mustard Seed in Calgary, talking about the Mustard Seed, a familiar name, but what are they all about and why are they coming to Leftbridge? And so that is on Thursday at 10 a.m. And I hope to see you then. And thank you for joining in, everybody. Goodbye.